Da, 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 I'm gonna da, 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 pronounce da, da. names wrong. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's <care>. okay. <laughs> that's okay. We are here in the studio. I'm Johnny Jungle Guts, the top notch gamer, aka the top notch gamer. And I'm in the studio with Natalie Clibonel. 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 It can go either way. It can go nice. either way. Equestrian. <laughs> animal fan. Natalie, what? Uh, what do you got planned for your Saturday night? Oh, God. Um, that assumes I have plans for my Saturday night, which I almost never do. Sure. We'll do something at some point. We'll do something at some point. Any horse-related stuff going on uh, this weekend? I'm like, I have to go back and feed the horses after this. After this? Yeah. No, just lessons. It's a pretty average weekend, other than a little bit rainy and boring because mm-hmm. of the rain. Not that it's currently raining. So, how long have you been uh, doing stuff with horses? I've been riding pretty much my whole life. I guess I started, like, riding more or riding more in a more structured sense when I was around eight. Around eight years old. Okay. Yeah. And uh, how, uh, how did you sort of get into it? What was your, what was, like, what do you, how, how does an eight-year-old, what were you doing before you were eight that was less structured um i mean i I went to ride i have we have family out in new mexico so Mm -hmm. i would go and ride out there and ride their ponies and stuff and Uh but then my mom's whole thing was like you're not allowed to take lessons until you're eight years old because she did a lot of things based on like various incendiary books that she would read incendiary books at some at some book at some point some book said that children shouldn't ride until they're eight years old so i wasn't allowed to take lessons till i was eight and I would ask, like, all the time, and she'd be like, no, 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 you're not eight yet. And then one time my babysitter took me to the dry cleaner, and there was a flyer for horse camp. And I was like, I'm eight now. Mm-hmm. I found this flyer for horse camp. I'm ready. Oh, my gosh. Oh, here, can you read this little yep. summary right here? All you need to win this battle are Edgar and Celeste. Have Celeste use Runic every single turn, and the bosses won't be able to do anything. Have Edgar use the drill tool every turn, and the bosses will take massive damage. They can't hurt you. They get hurt bad. Easy victory here. All right. That sounds like an easy victory. Uh, so, so yeah, moms always read incendiary books. Or, like, I feel like my mom would always, like, read magazines, and then she'd be like, I've been doing a lot of reading. And <laughs> oh, God. It was, like, a terrible... reading, like, home whatever journal, which basically I feel like a lot of those women's magazines are just designed to make girls feel like horrible, you know? Most of them are designed absolutely to make girls feel horrible. My mom at one point, I think like her therapist told her that she had to be more, um, she didn't have a really like structured or aggressive style of parenting. Okay. Um, She kind of mostly allowed me to parent myself and if I did anything super egregious she'd be like maybe maybe not that and I'd be like okay Okay. maybe not that but we'd have like a discussion about it like why not that yeah and it was pretty easygoing and then at some point her therapist was like no you need to be firmer and more aggressive and like that was the one time in my life my mom actually slapped me she slapped you why did she slap you I don't remember I have no this is the problem this is a problem with like a strictly punitive form of parenting like 90% of the things I remember being punished and I have no recollection of what I did to get punished sure. so I did not connect in any way like you did something wrong and then you got punished I just remember like being punished and that's about it I remember my mom slapped me on the butt one time and uh, I like because I was running too far ahead of her and then I just ran more far ahead of her and was so like, I'm going to go you. tell dad or something like He's that. He's got longer arms. Right. <laughs> he can reach further. Yeah. So it was just uh, completely, completely pointless. But I also think our parents, maybe coming from the like hippie generation, I don't know. I sort of wonder if some of the love ethos of that dovetailed in a kind of horrible way with like parenting help self-help books where yeah i feel like a lot of them were just like i don't want to parent the way that i was parented and then they were like well what the fuck do i do then? yeah and then mm-hmm. it just created some really strange like sort of like evasion strategies i mean like i have a friend with kids and she's like if my kids are allowed in the back seat i'll throw a shoe with them yeah you know? and it's really effective it works really well sure but, like 
But I feel like when you're feeling a lot of compunction, you're like, I'm going to punish you really hard, but I'm going to also feel really guilty and terrible about it. It just creates a lot of weird situations. Yeah. So your mom waited till you were eight to let you ride a horse. What kind of horse were you getting on at eight years old? Oh, no, she didn't wait till eight to let me... I, this was the thing that was really confusing. I was allowed to, like, be set loose on this little pony for, like, hours and hours alone all day wandering around this ranch in New Mexico, but I couldn't take lessons and have somebody watch me ride and do something structured until I was, like, eight. That's so Again, funny. Again, the weird, like, reading things about parenting versus, right. like... You read the thing and then you're, like, you think that that's just the the gospel or something like that so but you know i think a lot of little girls have an interest in horses or ponies but yeah, you've absolutely. stuck with it your whole life yeah then. absolutely yeah because how old are you now i'm 30 how are you feeling about that I feel pretty good about it. I, it was not really like the massive changeover that I thought it was going to be. Like, it mm -hmm. didn't make me feel dramatically different about life in any way. Sure. I mean, everyone I've ever talked to has just totally uh, loved their 30s um, and that thought they were, like, really awesome. Yeah, so. I only know a handful of people who are like, we're old and now we're going to die soon. And I'm like, well, I don't think that that's, that's really accurate. That's not really accurate at all. Stanley is 92 years old, and he still goes to uh, conventions or something. I mean, Stanley's a crook, but I just can't believe that he's 92 and still doing it, like, the way he does it, you know? Anyway. I swear I had a weird encounter with Stanley at Cantor's sometime in my life when I was in college. It's very possible he is a Jewish fellow. Little known fact, they actually used to change all the names of the... Uh, comic book writer stanley's real name is stanley lieber right yeah and jack I remember Kirby, that about a couple yeah. of them but i don't remember it was a mostly jewish uh i guess you would call it industry comic books yeah uh but they had to sort of keep that a uh, secret because of people being anti-semitic in those times and also it's interesting though because the character of the thing from um the fantastic four has a lot in common with the jewish uh, Golem, Golem, which is like a like a rock monster. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So you start riding at eight. Like, what do they have? Like special horses for little girl, little people to children to go on? I mean, not, you mean in terms of like size? Or I actually, just I actually behavior? Rode, I don't know. No, mostly. I mean, if you're teaching kids or beginners, you mostly want a really easygoing horse, one that's you know that you know is relatively safe, one that's not prone to super erratic behavior. I mean, uh -huh. all horses are prone to erratic behavior. They're horses. That's... Mm hmm How, uh, what's the craziest, like, situation you've ever gone through with a horse, like, acting it out? Oh, man. Um, like, whew. I'm trying to think of, like, what the craziest one... I've had to, like, the, that's, like, happened to me, like, because a lot of times, a lot of times the really crazy ones, like, you end up being fine, and then sometimes these ones that are sort of, like, oh, I don't seem like that big of a deal, you end up with, like, a terrible concussion, or, like, really, yeah. Wow. Like, physically. Have you gotten a concussion to... from riding horses? Oh, God, I think I've had a lot. Wow. I don't, I mean, I have, I, like, in, the ones that I really remember because they affected me really negatively, I have at least three. Oh, um, my gosh. And I definitely have more than that from when I was younger, and my brain casing was more resilient and I didn't feel the effects as much. Right. Right. Yeah, I had one a couple of years ago where I basically felt drunk for two weeks. And I oh was my like gosh. losing some words. How how long ago was that? Um that was I'm trying to think. That one was probably like five four or five years ago. Mm-hmm. And then I had another one that was not as bad, but bad enough like three years ago. Okay. And I haven't you know, I haven't had any since then. That's good. So, but no, but what, what, so what's like a situation, like, or maybe it wasn't just the horse, it was like something else was going on, plus the horse was acting up, like, what's like, give me an example I mean, of like one. The, so like the worst falls that you, I would say almost the worst falls that you ever have are ones where your horse goes down with you, uh -huh. or on top of you, Sounds in some bad, capacity, yeah. it's always bad. And it's like, even if you're not doing anything, like, even if you're just walking a horse and it trips and it falls down, like that much mass moving at the ground sort of uncontrolled at that space it's like almost guaranteed concussion or something crummy happens 
So mostly stressful situations with horses, horses revolve around falling off horses, getting falled on by a horse. Yeah, I mean, there's a vari- there, there's there's kind of like a limitless amount of really stressful situations you can get into with horses. They're like, you know, like even a small pony is like 600 some odd pounds and things can just go really... They're, oh they're my like 600 gosh. Pa- at least 600 pounds, on average probably closer to 1,200 pound creatures who like they're they're made like they're the thing that they have like evolved to do is to be hyper aware of tiny changes in their environment and react to them really strongly and rapidly yeah <laughs> like, and ponies are more maybe sensitive or more they or are what? smarter and naughtier is okay. what ponies are and they are closer, to, there's like a the terrible adage about ponies, which I do not believe in because I happen to love ponies. It, it's it's a very special, um, they're like an acquired taste. A yeah. lot of horse people hate ponies, and uh-huh. I really love ponies, mm-hmm. but, you know, the, the common adage with ponies is, you know, lower to the ground, closer to hell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, all right, let me hear this, this next little bit right here. What does it say? Save your game and use a tent. Okay, I did that. Now go through the door on the right. Make your way up the stairs until you reach the Magitech research facility. All right, here we go. So, what uh, what is the appeal of ponies over or, or in comparison to horses then? Like, what do you like about them? They're just, they're, I mean, their intelligence Smarter. makes them... Fun. I mean, not, and it's not that they're not very smart horses. It's not like they're uniformly smarter right. or less smart. But, you know, they're like... I think they get a raw deal because people start putting a kid on an uneducated pony a lot sooner than they would on, like, say, a larger horse. Mm-hmm. And so they don't get the same... A lot of them don't get the same level of, like, care and education put into them as a larger horse. They're... Most of them almost exclusively ridden by kids. Which, yeah. you know kids are learning and they make dumb choices sure. a lot of the time, as, as do many adults make sure. them. We all make dumb choices sometimes, but ponies get put into a lot of crummy situations and have to put up with a lot and they're super smart and sometimes they they come up with creative ways to avoid having to do the things that their people would like them to do. Okay, like what Which would be... Which I think be... is totally legit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, give me an example. What's a cre- What do you mean creative ways to avoid doing what they might want to do? Um, we had one pony at one point that, uh, th- one of the trainers at our barn had a really good little rider who rode ponies and jumped around and did really well mm-hmm. at shows, and so he bought this pony really cheap, and he was like, ah, oh, this pony's dirt cheap, I'm gonna have this little kid ride it and show it, she's gonna make it look great, and I'll turn around and sell it for three times what we bought it for. That would be great. Uh, the first time the kid got on it, it bucked, bucked and twisted so hard it threw her at the ground, broke her elbow. Oh my <laughs> gosh. And then... It, as it was going, and then it, like, took off running around the arena, and it, when it got to where it knew the gate was, it sort of bumped the gate, and the gate had been dummy locked, it hadn't actually been locked, okay. so it bumped the gate, and the gate flew open, and the pony then took off and tore around the barn and took a good long time to catch. Wow. And from that point forward, this pony would actually start, just in case the gate was dummy locked again, even with a rider on his back, he would go around the arena and then he would throw his body against the gate hoping that it would pop open and he could go oh out and around the arena. Wow. So now not to be speciesist, but what or breedist, I guess you would say, but what would you say is like considered to be like the more most relaxed breed of horse or, or group of horses? I mean these qualities are things that, like, I mean, like, with dogs, like, certain traits get bred for. So it's not so much species. I mean, we it's talk just about, a reality. Yeah, I mean, we talk about having, like, um, horses are often divided into what we call, like, hot bloods, warm bloods, and cold bloods. Okay. So cold bloods tend to be, like, the, obviously has nothing to do with the actual, like, temperature of their blood. They're not, like, mm-hmm. reptilian horses. They're just, they tend to be, like, the what are called draft horses, like the Budweiser horses. Okay. Clydesdales, Shires, Percherons, um... Belgian giraffes, they they tend to be like the ones that were like big farm horses. You uh-huh. know, they were not breeding those horses to be really like saucy and have a lot of charisma. They were right. breeding them to work very reliably, pull a plow very slowly. So they're strong and they're mellow. <laughs> like so, any of those like in that realm, you usually find pretty mellow customers. But in warm bloods too. I mean, warm bloods are funny because they can really range. Like you can find ones that are super mellow and easygoing. And quarter horses, too. They wouldn't be considered cold bloods. But you can also find really mellow quarter horses. 
And what's the, did you say hot blood? Is that another one? Yeah, they're hot blood. Who's, what are those breeds, would you say? So, like, everyone's familiar, most people are more familiar with horse racing. So, thoroughbreds, mm-hmm. the American thoroughbred, is what's considered a hot blood. Arabians are considered hot bloods. Um, I would even venture to say that there are some warm bloods that have more of that type of horse in them that should be considered hot bloods. Right. They tend to run a little hotter. But mm-hmm. saddlebreds. Anything that's sort of like more bred for its kind of performance and bravado and less bred for its dependability. Mm-hmm. So what kind of horse were you riding at eight? At eight, I was, my favorite horse was this horse named Jake. Okay. And he was a, originally a race horse and he'd been retired from racing and he had been this one family's like hunter jumper horse for years and years and years and years and years and then he became a lesson horse. So mm-hmm. he was a thoroughbred, but he was a very, very old thoroughbred. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like how old? Um, he was probably 22 or so when I started wow. riding him. Wow. And how, what's the average life expectancy of uh, it's horses? Tr- it's like with a lot of animals, it's getting longer. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say like now it's not uncommon for, ho- for horses to live from their like mid to late 20s into their even their early to mid 30s. I've been mm-hmm. seeing more and more of... Um, where it used to be, like, when I was little, like, a 20-year-old horse was like, whoa, old horse. Right. Super old. But And now it's becoming more normal. It's becoming much more normal. And there, I mean, there are Grand Prix horses that compete into their 20s, which is, like, upper... It's like it's like somebody being a, an Olympic athlete in their 80s or 70s. Probably late 70s is closer. Wow. And uh, what... Uh, so you're learning to ride horses. When does that start to enter into more of, like, I don't even know enough about it, but like different types of competitions. What are those even? What kind of like what kind of stuff were you doing besides just going out and riding a horse, or was that what you? I went out and rode for a bunch. I didn't start. I probably started showing when I was like nine or ten, mm-hmm. so like about, about a year after I had been riding like in lessons. Yeah. Consistently. Yeah, and what is that? I don't even know exactly what that means. What do you do it when you're showing? Um, it depends on your discipline. There's, like, all different disciplines, and they're all, like, kind of their complete own rabbit holes to go down. Mm-hmm. I was I was showing... I was showing mostly hunters as a kid, so it's like you're going out over a course of... And if you say hunters in America, it means nothing to people in Europe, because hunting in Europe means actual, actual fox hunting. Okay, like on a horse, right. galloping through a field, jumping over stiles and ditches and, like, banks and through, you know, chasing, chasing after a pack of baying dogs. Um, hunters in America is like you're cantering around this neatly manicured arena, arena and jumping a pretty darn simple course of fences for the yeah. most part. I mean, they've sort of started to bring in, like it's been a more recent development that they've started to bring in or bring back in more complexity of courses. But, yeah. I mean, it's pretty much just learning things like pace and track and like how to ride a good turn and how to set your horse up and balance your horse to these turns. So you sure. go out and you do like two or three rounds over your fences and in hunters they're judging your horse's form and style and you know they'll take into account your riding a little bit mm-hmm. but that comes into play more with equitation sure so you you riding all through out high school right yes and at some point but at some point in there you get really into art too also yeah i mean i've i mean i think if, you were you always were I into was art always into con- <laughs> congruently yeah there, there were yeah. Like, concurrent obsessions probably. sure and uh and so that started at a really young age too yeah, like mo- I feel like most of like the like when I was like playing with friends, like most of my like playing with friends were these like elaborate things where be like okay, so we're gonna like draw the world that we live in, and we're gonna draw what the things that we're imagining that we are look like, and we're gonna draw all the things that we have and all the animals that are our friends, and we have these like elaborate yeah. drawings, and then like by the time we're like okay, now we're ready to play, and then like someone's mom would come and be like all right, it's time to go home, and we're like yeah. we just we just finished this right but. exactly, so. uh but eventually you're like gonna go to art school you went to art school i went to art school where'd you go i went to otis college of art and design and how was that it was actually great i mean i feel like incredibly i mean the first year was like probably the one of the most miserable years of my entire life but (laughs) why was that um it was just it was like an incredibly like lonely time and it was only like partially to do with school it was just like really i'm I, like, I still, after four years of art school, can't draw a straight line with a ruler, and the first year of school is, like, you know, really important, important draftsmanship things. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I... was I... notorious for turning in form and space projects with blood all over them, which I was not allowed to do. 
And then one time I just got so frustrated that like I just cut away like the holes. I like made all these cuts in the surface of this cube or something that we had to make, and it was mostly to cut off like the patches of my blood that were all over it. And what is that you about? Just never. You should never trust me with sharp things. I'm what, not allowed how did, to, to oh, touch so, sharp wait, things. Wait, the blood was on the work because of an accident, or you were doing that on purpose? No, not on purpose. I would cut myself oh my trying God. to make these things. And for what class? It was called form and space. What does that even? I, it's like it's like the three dimension. You know, like at Otis, they, they form they and space. Yeah. Okay. It was like the like you know make a cube out of like one by one plywood mm -hmm. and make a variety of other shapes out of a one by one plywood and make perfect pyramids out of foam core without any of the edges looking rough, which probably is not challenging to most people, but the, these are not things that were my strengths. No, I had the same problem. I went to Savannah College of Art and Design, and they had a foundation year like that, and I just couldn't even hack it. I just dropped out and ended up going to a school where they didn't even have that. But, so, <laughs> you were lonely because you were at a new school? Well, I, I, like, so student housing at Otis was, like, incredibly, incredibly expensive, it was like they, they didn't actually have student housing. They like sort of like sort of leased out these apartments in this big apartment complex down the thing. And I like couldn't afford to be in them and also attend school. So I had to get a different apartment like way, way off campus. So like where like a bunch of people lived either in those apartments or nearby there. I lived like way out in Culver City. Okay. In this apartment. Oh, wow. It was super seedy and terrible with this gross seedy landlord who was like kind of a... Oh, I mean, he was like an easygoing guy, but he was sort of just a terrible slumlord. <laughs> right, okay. And, and so I just like lived out there on my own and mostly like, I, I'm not like a super social person that's good at making friends easily. Mm, I don't know. Yeah, I'd almost agree with that. So was that the first time you were living like away from your parents too? Yeah, yeah. So, so the just, first like, time you're living away from your parents, you're in this like weird, uh... Uh, living situation that's super lonely and creepy. Yeah, basically. That's stressful. But eventually it got better. Yeah, it got much, much better. I moved in with Ajax, who I still, mm -hmm. um, and our other friend at the time, Brooke, but I've lived with Ajax, like, basically since then. She's my permanent roommate. Sure, wow. How many years has that been? Uh, so I moved in with Ajax when I was, like, 19, I think. So I've lived with her 11 years. Wow. Ajax is my longest running relationship. So, so you make it through school and you get out. Because it seems like, as I've known you, you you have been doing more the stuff with the horses and you're not really in the art game, you know. Right. I mean, not yet. In terms of making stuff, yes. In terms of like trying to like show stuff super actively or anything like that not really yeah and how are you feel how do you feel about that i feel okay about it i think uh, there's like elements of me that are like maybe not quite resilient enough to i don't know like i like i certainly don't think i would have made it through grad school i saw like a very good friend of mine like you know it's either like the crucible that makes you something great or it just kind of immolates you and he basically got immolated as an artist <laughs> like he wow. actually made really cool work at one point and then he just started making crappier and crappier work and at grad now, school at grad school and now he manages an rei and doesn't make any things <laughs> but, um, right so you're you're and he's probably in a lot of debt too um, or no, who knows? He, no, he actually went to uci and they don't actually oh, they actually pay you to go to grad okay. school they don't make you I go into see. a lot of debt Okay, and what kind of work were you uh, doing in school? Like, what besides having blood all over it, what did some of the artwork that wasn't look actually like? things? That, those weren't actually things I wanted. to Right, do. exactly. That's that horrible foundation year forced project thing. Yeah, that's so annoying. Uh, so, what kind of stuff were you? Did you end up making? Like, did you? Do you guys have like a thesis show or something like that over there? Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah. Um, I, I like feel like my educational like motivation was like to make as few choices as possible uh -huh. at any given moment so like i at one point i made a giant stained glass window uh i did a bunch of performance work um i did a bunch of like writing and text-based stuff a bunch of photography um made a couple books <laughs> so what was what was so you're saying you're doing performance what was um like what kind of stuff um, I would say, like, the performance stuff that I... I mean, I, it's either, like, 
it's sort of like performance video. They were like documentations of performances, basically. Um, me and my ex-boyfriend did my did a series of videos called "Making the Most of Our Time Together." Okay. It was just um, they were like we pick like a completely useless task that had no actual like that we weren't gonna actually continue to do in any way, or there was no reason to continue to do it in any way. But we would like begin the learning process and sort of like we just like start having never done it before and then videotape us like coming to what we felt like was some level of competence at performing that task what would a task be give me an example um so like one of them was bringing a seesaw into perfect balance uh-huh with our respective weight differences um how how big was he a big guy no he wasn't super big but he was he was about like he was a good like had a good like 40 40 or so pounds on me sure so. sure here, read me this little this little one. I think we're there now. This boss has a varying weakness, which he can change at any time using the wall change ability. If you want to try and keep up with him that way, then that's fine. But I find it much easier to simply rely on normal powerful attacks like pummel and drill chainsaw. Runic isn't too helpful since even his most powerful magic spells technically aren't magic, like aqua rake. So have Celeste just act a healer for the fight. Okay. So, uh, what happened to him? <laughs> um... He, uh, he broke up with me. Oh, what a, a couple prick. Of years ago. No, I think it was actually, a, I think it actually was a really wonderful thing. Although at the time, I did not interpret it as I mean, as yeah, at the wonderful. time, it's always just the worst. Oh, my goodness. But now, uh, so, so, uh, and how many years were you together? Uh, we were together seven years. Oh my gosh, that is just... Uh, beyond my comprehension, I think two years is the longest I've made it. Would you say you're like definitely like a relationship person? What's weird is that I would absolutely through like my entire life have said, no, I'm not a relationship person, and yet I've kind of categorically been in sort of relatively long-term relationships. True. So. True. And you're married now. I'm married now. That's really crazy. But really cool. I'm really into it. I think a lot, I think a lot of, uh, I also just really like weddings. I just really, and your wedding was really beautiful. Thank you. It, I went to, well, actually, I don't want to say that on camera, but <laughs> we'll just say it because no one's listening. I went to three weddings last summer, and yours was really fun. That's what I'm going to say. Yay. Of the three weddings I went to, yours was really fun. Though I had such a blast, and I had such a blast at all the, all the bachelor parties, but it was at, uh, Natalie's wedding was at a... Oh, you could probably describe it better than me. Zorthian Ranch yeah. is... Um, well, like, anyone who grew up on the east side of Los Angeles knows it as the Nude Ranch. Um, right. That was my it sort of... It, it belonged to this guy, Gerard Zorthian, um, who sort of acquired this property and then proceeded to, like, build a bunch of stuff and paint a bunch of stuff, and he used to throw these massive parties, and his family still owns it, and... A lot of people live up there. I think Truly Hall was living up there for a while. Mm -hmm. and, um, she was actually the one who got us in touch with um, Pat, who helped us plan everything and get everything set up. So. Sure. Well, this was easy. These bosses are just pushovers. I'm just ripping through this game here. Uh, and there's animals everywhere also. There's animals everywhere. There's a llama named Rama. Like, as we were and setting up... Miller. As we were setting up, there was a llama... Like, just walking around through the tables and stuff. Yeah, they told us he was not allowed to be loose during the actual wedding because he would, like, harass people for food and oh, yeah. knock things over. And just I can't even imagine. Chaos. But he was very sweet and he had such an adorable underbite. Yeah, he was really cute. All right, here, let me hear this little bit right here. Proceed through the door and press the switch at the top of the room. After this, you will receive six new espers. Oh, it's great. Run over beside Sid and get onto the elevator. Save your game at the save point at the bottom, then speak with Sid. Soon enough, you'll find yourself atop some kind of minecart and having to battle your way through the tunnel. You won't have Celeste in your party to heal, so do your best to avoid damage, and if you do take it, you'll need to rely on items to heal yourself. Okay. Eventually, you'll encounter a boss enemy. What are you playing, by this, the way? I'm so sorry. I didn't even preface that. This is Final <laughs> Fantasy VI. Uh, it's a sort of, like, industrial fantasy game. The premise is that this government, uh, evil empire or whatever, is, uh, I guess you could say reverse engineering magical creatures to make weapons it's really and you're a part of like a resistance movement that's trying to 
stop that. So espers are the magical creatures. And um, it's really sad because like once they turn into this, they're like dead. Or they're like in a crystal form. But then they can like choose to bond with your characters to help you learn magic. Which in this world hasn't existed for like hundreds of years. This is sort of the premise of the game. Wait, then where are they getting the magical creatures? The magical creatures exist, but... The ma oh, the magical creatures are from another, like, dimension, sort of, oh. that they go into and, um, get out the... get the espers out of. And w the main character of the game is half-human, half-esper. But she's, like, currently in a coma, I guess. And we're, like, in the process of... Stopping them from keeping on doing this work, and also figuring out a way for her to, like, wake up. It's the best way I could describe it. So, uh, yeah, and this is a game I've played through, like, six or seven times, and probably gotten about two-thirds of the way through. But, um, I never have beaten it, so I'm, f I'm finally trying to beat it in this insane format of... Let's Play videos. <laughs> which are so... I mean, because when I was a kid, I used to make my dad watch me play video games all the time, and he would always fall asleep. <laughs> so once I discovered that people were doing it on the internet, and people actually would watch sometimes, that was just mind-blowing for me. So that really made me get into it. But, um... Anyway... What were we talking about? Oh, the, your, the wedding. The animals... And you've, I, the thing is, Natalie, I, honestly, I often think of myself as, like, like the, like the fake version of you, because you work with actual horses, and I'm, obs and I'm obsessed with My Little Ponies. I was also obsessed with My Little That's Ponies. That's true. And I have a collection probably, like as large or larger than yours, except mine are all the ones, like, from when I was... With the real hair, that smell kind of nice some of them they I remember have like a crazy smell there's like a really specific My Little Pony smell that yeah. like used to be like mm -hmm. pretty intense for me as a small kid <laughs> what do you think that is what do you think attracts horses to um or like why do you think little girls and little gay people are so into ponies I don't and know horses. it is a really this is a really weird thing and this is like it's such a weird I mean I feel like Gender stuff always gets weird and very gray and a lot and of And it's messy, yeah. We can't really make generalizations, but... Can't, but I would say, like, the weird... The, kind of the weird thing about my job is that it, like, I feel like I'm, like, performing this weird amateur census all the time about, like, what demographics of people are riding horses, mm -hmm. what are the most common, like, names for girls, girls and certain boys, like, within certain, like, wealth demographics. Okay. Like, there's, like, weird things that, like, when you teach tons of kids for years and years and years and years and years you just sort of it's like this like weird index of like information that you get and like i would say one of the weirder observations that i've made and i don't know if it's you know it's hard it's it's at least here in southern california there are actually many 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 more guys riding now as kids okay like, the weird thing that you see when i was little is there would be absolutely like there might be one boy at any given barn ever and then like but when you would look up into the professional ranks it would be you know predominantly male and i mean it's, it's certainly there would definitely be a lot of female professionals as well but like you would see like predominantly men as professionals and you're like where did they all come from like mm -hmm. none of them rode as but they all you know they all have to be somewhere yeah um mm -hmm. but now there are a lot more a lot more guys riding as kids and i think that is awesome do you think that's because parents are getting more comfortable with, like... I mean, it's so... I see, I just almost... It might, and I think that's an American thing versus a European thing, because in, in no way in Europe is it considered, like, I don't know, anything for a, a guy to ride in an English saddle, whereas here it's like, well, a boy should be in a Western saddle, and you're like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, oh, what's the difference between those saddles? What's that about? Um, Western saddles are like if you've watched a spaghetti western or played bang. Yeah. <laughs> the, like the saddles that um, would be used for like ranching and cattle work and mm -hmm. all that. So a lot of people use them for trail riding because they're big and they distribute weight really well. They mm -hmm. have a horn in the front. If you've ever gone to like a, a oh yeah the horse horn stable in the front yeah with the horn which is not a handle it's to put your rope around but 
then that's a Western, that's a Western saddle. And then an English saddle is, um, not as tiny as a racing saddle, but more similar to that. It's small and light. Okay. It's made to allow the horse's body a little bit more freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. Um, so that they can do things like jump over enormous fences and uh huh yeah like that. more like like a, maybe Western saddle is more for like a longer ride or something yeah I mean like it would that. be yeah you'd definitely be more comfortable for a really really long ride in a Western saddle than you yeah. would be in an English saddle yeah and you know everything you're describing to me there's this you know you're you're getting concussions it's so much work uh. But you just, something about, and you're not obviously not the only person who's like this. Some people are just drawn to horses and that just becomes their thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I don't, I mean, it's, it's like, some people it's like it's in their family or it's in whatever. And people are like, oh, is your family? And it's like, no, my, no, like, the family that I refer to in New Mexico aren't even like my blood relatives. So, like, no one in my family, I mean, my mom really likes horses, but like nobody in my family rides uh -huh. at all. <laughs> like, I'm the only one. Yeah. Um, was there any, because my family was like a sailing family. Did your family have like any like funny thing that they were really into? Uh, my family was me and my mom, so we were definitely not a particularly anything family. Okay, yeah. We went hiking a lot. That there you go. Kind of, we were kind of a hiking family, I guess, but other than that. And camping? No, I did not get to camp until college. I always really wanted to camp, but my mom, had, you know, again, like with these like weird things, she's like, okay. oh, I don't, you know, it would just be like me and you, and I, I wouldn't feel like I could protect you, and you know, it's like these weird, like sort of, yeah, crummy sort of gendered things where she was like, we can't go camping because we don't have a man around, and I was like, really? Oh my gosh. Moms can also do have those weird, like, I remember a little boy in my class, he wasn't allowed to sleep over because his mom said she wouldn't be able to save him if there was a fire. <laughs> that was why he couldn't come to sleepover parties. And so he would just lie every birthday that came up and say that it was his dad's birthday. But we figured it out really quickly. So, that would be a lot of birthdays for any man whose dad would age incredibly rapidly. Yeah. And you don't have any brother. You have brothers and sisters? Um, I have two biological half-sisters on okay. my dad's side, and I have mm -hmm. a stepsister. Mm -hmm. But she didn't live with us growing up. She lived with her mom. Yeah. Because your parents split up. Um, my parents my parents were never together. Wow. <laughs> but they still get along pretty well. Um, my mom and my dad? Yeah. I mean, like... I, I don't know that they... I guess they're kind of friends in some weird way. They're... I can't imagine them interacting very much, but... Right, okay. I guess I... I guess I was just seeing the context of, like, your wedding, which, of course, they would both be, like, really heavily involved in. No, no, no. My dad was not... He just showed up. My, right, okay. My, and, and my mom really didn't want him to come at all. Oh, but yeah? I felt like it would be weird if he didn't come, so... Okay, yeah, gotcha. And your... But your mom now is... Is remarried? Yes. Yeah. And what age were you for that one? Um, I was about eight and a half, just to turn nine, which was coincidentally when yeah. I got my first pony. Yes, what a <laughs> funny coincidence. No, that was like actually like a negotiated treaty. Oh <laughs> that my was, gosh. That was pretty much... That's impressive. That's what you gotta do though. I mean, I just remember girls in my class wanting horses so bad, and it took them years to just convince their parents to let them get into it. It was uh, such a such a labor, you know. I mean, for good reason. It's an inc even you know even in the best of scenarios, it's an incredibly expensive sport, which is like a thing that I have to grapple with from an ethical standpoint. Yeah. What are some other like ethical stuff you find yourself grappling with with horses? Um, you know, luckily the kind of the, the realm that I work in, like I. I teach mostly kids and amateurs. I have kids that are competitive, but not necessarily kids that like want to get to the top of the top of the top of their sport. I feel like there's certain, you know, and there are people that manage to like float this ethically and wonderfully, but there's a lot of, I mean, it's really like when you get into the upper levels where people are paying a ton of money for their horses and a ton of money to go out and show that there's maybe just a lot of pressure to keep these horses going and to like produce certain results and, okay. you know, I sort of kept myself in a realm where I have a lot of work, you know, you know, and, and it would, like, it's like I would feel really terrible if I only could work with people who, you know, had the money to pour into all this stuff. And so, like, I, it's really important to me. I always have working students 
It's something that's always been very important to me. What does that mean, working students? Um, students who maybe don't necessarily have their own horses and don't and can't necessarily afford lessons, but they come and they work for me. Mm-hmm. You know, either doing feeding or blanketing or packing extra horses. Wow. Okay. Um, some of them even work in the working student program at the barn, which is they go and they groom for. <laughs> it sounds kind of terrible, but they groom for the kids that have more means or more money and they in that way <laughs> sure. work off their lessons yeah and, um and they they you know they still get to ride and get to be around the horses and that's always been a really important part of my program yeah yeah it's funny uh like i used to teach at a school for dance lessons and it's just it was just interesting to see like you know parents come in some parents come in and they would just you know sign their kids up on the spot no questions asked really like n- no uh rigor moral and then you have other parents come in and they really you know because it's a budget stretch for them like they really want to find out all these details and see if there's any way they can swing it and it's just it's just crushing you know when you see people who it's really like they really want to their daughter really wants to take dance and they can't do it i don't know so you, so you guys do have like uh, sort of like ways for people to stay involved with horses or get involved with horses, and if even if they don't have as the quite financial means, because like yeah, how absolutely. much? I mean, how much does it cost a year to like have a horse or something like? Give me some money estimates. So I would say if you have a horse that you're boarding that's in full training, full grooming. Um, and this is and with shoes and whatever in, in maybe extra feed or supplements and what have you, not counting going to any horse shows. So just like maybe training, grooming, and shoes and sort of like basic necessities. Okay. You'd be looking at spending probably at least around two thousand dollars a month. A month. A month. Oh my god, that's in, that's in, that's really. It's huge. It's huge. Um, and so, you know, like, and so, like, for example, like, the last kind of generation of girls that I brought up, mm-hmm. um, I think only one of them had, one of them had her own horse. Right, and, right. Like, but all of them were working off their lessons, and, you know, it, the biggest limiting factor is that, like, a horse that can jump a certain height, you know, proficiently and safely tends to cost kind of a certain set amount, and, you you know, and the current like the constant upkeep and veterinary costs and stuff like that can be burdens so i mean yeah maybe you know there was like a height limiting factor like my kids could never you know we're never showing in the three foot division because we didn't have the horses to do it at the time right okay but they all got to ride they all got to go out to shows they Uh all got to go out to clinic and so sure cool and they're all really good horse people and that's kind of that's a thing that gets lost with the people that show up and they pay a bunch of you know they, pay, they show up, their horse is already saddled for them, they get on the horse, they ride in their lesson, they hand their horse off to the groom, and then they walk away. Yeah. Like, you completely lose the understanding of the fact that you have a partner in the sport that you're doing, and yes. not just sort of like a slightly more animated soccer ball. Right, <laughs> right, okay. And that's the way you look at it, is it's a partnership. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But what is, like, what, what is it that just... It keeps you in it, you know? Wait, what are you saying? So I was just looking at the it's crazy, super weird, like, weaving yeah. phallic deck that they're all on. Oh, yeah, that is a crazy design. This game, the, I'm playing it on Steam, which is, like, uh, I'm really into. I mean, I'm really into Steam. It's, like, a, it's like a way of just, like, downloading video games. So now there can be, like, people who are independent game developers who are distributing games and like sort of on the same in the same sphere as like big studios which i like that sort of egalitarianness of it but this release is like the graphics are like a little bit too bright that compared to the original version of this game and that these backgrounds are new but yes this is a weird this is a weird structure and this character it's this guy with the white hairs airship i guess you would call it and, um, he, like, he, like, you first get to know him because he, like, kidnaps you because he thinks you're, like, an opera singer that he's in love with or something. 
which is problematic to say the least, but uh, the airship is is definitely useful, so what are you going to do? Um, and I think this is the first point in the game when you actually can fly it yourself. That's a recurring theme in all Final Fantasy games, there's always flying boats, flying ships. Uh, but, uh, did you, were you out of video games as a kid? Was that another thing your mom was like, really cracked the whip on? I have never actually owned any kind of game console whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I was always outside. I was one of those kids. And that's, that's good. That's better than, I mean, honestly, when you were describing your friends throwing a shoe at her kids to get them to be quiet in the back of the car, it's better than some parents I see who they just put on, pop a DVD in because they've got TVs in the cars now in those big... That would be so hard for me. I would be so distracted. I could not drive while someone was watching a DVD behind me. It would be impossible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a fixture of... It wasn't DVDs. It was like VHS tapes were like a total fixture of um, my, like childhood road trips of mine. Ooh. We would like rent movies from like this really... This like movie rental place that had like very very cheap okay what is going on now where are we esper world okay here read read that to me when you have control again leave the house and go up examine the woman woman lying on the ground and choose to take her back with you that's commanding the next morning go up <laughs> further to the gate and speak to her again after another scene go down and speak with the elder mm -hmm. leave the house go left and up to approach the gate back in the human world again you'll get control of the ship Fly your airship north to reach Narsh. I think this is the story of how the main character's parents met. So we have the passed out lady, and we're nursing her back to health. And, and this is in, like, that magical creature land. This is the first time I think we're really seeing seeing it in this game. Let's see what all these people or these guys have to say for themselves. So, and also, like, my mom, I think, will admit to you that one of the things she did like, she didn't like the video games, um, and they kind of tried to hold out on that, but the one thing she did like about them was that they were very easy to clean up. <laughs> uh, because they were digital, mostly. Not entirely. But, uh, yeah, so where would you, like, go hiking and stuff as a kid? Up in the Angeles National Forest, mainly. Mm -hmm. I mean, anywhere we traveled to, we'd go hiking, but ma mainly up in the Angeles National Forest, up above the town where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And did you travel a lot as a kid? Yeah, a lot. Um, my mom's family all lived on the East Coast, and so we were like we were in, in New York a couple times a year, at City? least every year. Um, just outside, near Rochelle. Oh, okay, there. yeah, yeah. Is it uh, woodsy up there? Is it is that a woodsy town? Would you say? Um, in my memory it is, because they lived at, at like, on a cul-de-sac, and at the end were these things called the Nature Study Woods, which were just, like, some woods and a lake with a bunch of swans on it, which was pretty fantastic to me as, like, a, you know, born through seven-year-old. Sure. Sw swans can be kind of nasty, though. You gotta be careful. Swans and geese both. But... Like, we had swan that would... Uh, was by the lake at my high school, and it would, like, chase us, kind of. They do that. Yeah. I once had a babysitter that was, like, horribly chased and attacked by a goose while rescuing one of my toy horses mm -hmm. when I was, like, two. <laughs> did you not have cable TV t as well as a child, or did you have cable? Um, we had cable. I didn't, I mostly used it, I didn't, like, sleep as a kid. Ever. Okay. I was, like, really afraid of sleeping. I had tons of recurring nightmares and sleep paralysis and was, like, just terrified of sleeping. Wow. Um, I didn't really learn to sleep kind of semi-normally till college. Um, what, what, what was, what did they, like, where does that come from? I have no idea. No one else in my family that I know of has it, but... As far as, like, the stuff that I've read on sleep paralysis, it's, it's like, it's, you know, like, sleepwalk, when people sleepwalk, it's, like, the thing that, the chemical that gets released that makes it so that your body doesn't act on all the things that you're doing in your dream, like, doesn't go away quickly enough, so your brain starts to wake up, but your body, you can't actually move your body or make noise or, like, I, I used to try to, like, get out of it by, like, trying to, like, 
like move like a finger or toe and like start there. And oh, I've had that. I've had the sleep paralysis before. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. I think that. Did you see that weird like them flying all around like that? I think that was like a weird metaphor for them having sex because then there was like a little baby that appeared that I think was the main character. That That's was... like certain kinds of hawks and e eagles, right? They like they fucking fly. That's like... pretty cool. Yeah, the animal world is r replete. It is, it is full of um, insane sexual uh practices uh though not everyone knows or thinks that like for example uh boxer manny pacquiao have you kept up with any of this drama no no i have manny pacquiao is like i think he's one of the greatest boxers in the world and he's also a like senator in the philippines which is where he's from and he said in some kind of debate or uh you know, political arena spectrum that gay people were worse than animals because animals can tell the difference between male and female. I thought that was really, Wait, really funny. I don't think that anyone is alleging that people are gay because they can't tell. Right, the exactly. They're like, I really confused. I was just confused. It is really fascinating to me also because there are many, many animals who do... Right. gay stuff. There's a whole encyclopedia of it called Biological Exuberance. It's by a guy named Bruce Bagamel. There's very colorful illustrations. Definitely worth looking at. So he's just operating on this completely insane level of misinformation. That but, involves no science whatsoever. But that's cool. But it's also funny because, you know, I think obviously his cultural sphere is so different than ours, you know? Like, how old were you, would you say, when you found out, like, what being gay was and stuff? I'm trying to think. I would, I'm trying to remember what age I was. I probably was about, I want to say six. Wow. Um, well, and it was when my mom was, well, explaining to me, in addition to the fact that my piano teacher was um, probably, at the time, about 20 years older than me, the reason why I couldn't marry my piano teacher. Okay, right, there you go. <laughs> and one of the reasons, in addition to his being 30 years old, for, old the um, other reason the was, other that, reason he was, was that he was gay. Mm -hmm. Very good. See, I totally feel like I didn't, it wasn't until like, uh, I heard like this, I don't know, it was like a very long, slow process that unfortunately definitely involved like internet porn. That was, that was what happened to me. But I think, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to think about, you know, because this guy is saying these crazy homophobic things, but I was listening to, at CrossFit the other day, they played, I think it was What's My Age Again by Blink-182, and there's a line in that song where they say, the state looks down on I'm sodomy, sodomy. Which, which is a pretty insane line considering it's only 15 years old. I know, right? It's not an old, I mean, it, I mean, I guess it is a surprisingly old song from my perspective, but right. also surprisingly not that old for, yeah. For how different people look at gay stuff in America now than they did back then. And I yeah. think people forget, like, how, because it changed, I feel like it just, like, the larger gay rights situation just changed. It, I mean, California's a little different, but right. uh, I think the whole... Like, the whole cultural dynamic has shifted so much in the past 15 years on all of that, all of that stuff. It's crazy. Wait, where am I doing? Leave the house. We examine the woman. Go okay. down and speak with the elder. Leave the house. Go left up and approach the gate. Okay, so we got to just go back up to the gate. Uh, that was a really quick return from that, like, flying copulation to, like, the baby being ready-made. Oh, the baby just uh, fell down. Like, it was just all sort of metaphorical with the flying copulation, and then the baby just fell down into well, the center they, like, of the made screen. The baby, you know, like, it came from up there. Yes. <laughs> the the uh, stork. It's so funny because I... This game also came out 20 years ago, and I don't even know what the policies were about talking about sex in, in video games then. Like, video games were a less, much less wide-open... Uh, sphere than they are now. So they, they might have even been like a rule that they couldn't talk about it, or I don't know, maybe they were just trying to... They edit stuff from the Japanese version to the American version a lot in this, I will say that. Like, uh, like some of the outfits are more, a little bit more conservative in this, in the American, in the American dub 
of this game. Okay, where is the thing? So, okay. How long have you known Andy? How long have I known Andy? He was one of the first people I met at Otis. So I've known him since I was 17. Yeah. That's some amount of years ago that I can't count 13 years. Yeah. Whoa, mm -hmm. 13 years. That's pretty pretty amazing long time and you stayed friends with him all throughout that time or yeah i mean it, there, you know he was living in berlin for a while um, right so mm -hmm. there were definitely times when i was not seeing him as much but sure and what was your first impression of andy yeah i have to oh god i like had the hugest crush on him ever like from the moment i talked to him oh my was, god like, my first and then and it was like really embarrassing somebody in our year even was like Oh, yeah, Natalie, she has a huge crush on you. Like, just blatantly to him, which is... And But what happened? It just was bad timing? He already had a girlfriend? You already had a girlfriend? I, like, can't even imagine at that point in time that I would have been even, like, on the radar as somebody that he would have wanted to date. Why would you say that? I... I, I don't know, for a variety of reasons. Um, All right, let's get into it. And he was, like, always one of those people at school that, like, everybody knew who he was. He was making incredible work that everyone was super excited about. Like, really? Yeah, everyone everyone at school was super stoked on Andy, like, all the time. And, like, he was just, like, he was just, like, a person that, like, like I feel like almost no one at school would have been like, oh, I don't know who that is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and I was definitely, like, I don't You're not, living I was not that person. That well, you were living me. in a, in a slumlord house in, uh... That was so terrifying. The baby just, like, fell out of this her and then through the void of space <laughs> there. That's how she entered the human world. She got sucked out. That was, directly that was graphic. Out of the oh. The... oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. This is just intense. Uh, so, I, cannot, I can't picture him being that guy because he doesn't really have that, like, type A personality, you know? Like, I was... No, not type A. For, no, no. But I don't know. He was just like easygoing and friendly and like cool to everybody. And Are people were really into his work. What kind of work was he doing back then? Still a lot of painting. Ab like, what did it look like? Probably like less abstract. Uh huh. Um, I like. I don't know. If, like I could list. I could probably list like a variety of his projects. He was also like he was. He lived at this thing called Sars House, which was like a group that did sort of like interventionist somewhat sculptural, somewhat just interventionist projects with a couple of people. Interventionist. Describe what that is for our listening audience in your mind. I mean, like, in this particular state, they were usually, like, they were usually trying to, like, improve upon, like, usage in public spaces. That would mm -hmm. seem, or at least seem to largely be one of the things that they yeah. worked with. Like, you know, like, there was, like, this area that was, like, a cut-through that was a trail that a lot of people used, but it wasn't actually a trail. It was just sort of like a place where the weeds had been tamped down and they like sort of like actually like leveled out part of it and made it an actual walking trail and put stairs into the steep part of the hill and like put a little bench up midway through the through the trail. Just like doing sort of like, and they were just sort of like set to work on these things and act like they were supposed to be there and no right. one would question their presence or uh -huh. their like whether they were allowed to do the things that they were doing. Yeah, so like subtle, subtle gestures yeah. they were more doing. That's funny. I never had pictured Andy doing any work that was even really very performative like that. Would you say he's changed a lot since then? Um, I would say maybe in some outward ways, yes. And then in like more internal ways, maybe not so much. But okay. And what about you? Do you feel like you've changed a lot since freshman year of college? I... God, I hope so. But I have no real... Um, I don't really know how to... Well, I also feel like you're the type of person who doesn't go through, like... Like, I'm the type of person who goes through, like, radical, like, phases and... Like, all over the place, you know? And you seem, like, sort of a little bit more down to earth, so... It makes sense that... There might be some, some through lines there. I tend to have a lot of through lines, probably, that's true. Yeah. And that's sort of, you know, comforting that you've, you've got the... You've, it's like there, like... Horses are there, art is there, you know? 
for me, it's always like, uh, oh, maybe I'm like, like, you know, I used to do art and I'm still kind of doing art, but it's like, now it's taking on this weird shift of like, being like, when I was the first year at art school, I made a print that was like basically saying that I couldn't make artwork about video games or comics anymore because I was getting too cynical about it, but that I would come back to it again when I felt like I could be sincere make sincere work because I didn't want to make, I really don't like cynical artwork that much. I probably like it more now than I used to because LA has worn me down. How do you, uh, what are your thoughts on LA in general? Because I don't think of you as like a very LA person. That's funny because I think of myself as like an intrinsically LA person. Like I've lived here my entire life and it's incredibly important to me and I love LA. Okay. <laughs> Very deeply. I think maybe I'm still stuck in a perception of, of a type of Los Angeles that is like the one I was sort of taught as a child, you know, the... Right. The, the, the Hollywood um, thing or whatever or like, you want to call it. Or like at least, well... That would probably have been, like, earlier. I was going to say, like, slightly earlier would have been, like, a, like the Valley Girl sort of interpretation. Right, like, sure. Which sort of morphed into more of, like, a Hollywood thing at some point. But. Yeah. But what do you love about it? Um, a lot of things. I, lo I kind of, like, love... One of the things I, I like, the immediacy of the history of the place. I like the fact that, like, if you... Like, you can find a picture of Sunset Boulevard in um, 1916... And it's, like, literally, like, a clabbered house and, like, miles of orange groves. Okay. Which is, like, a hundred years from right now. Like, so, like, everything that's happened, like, everything that the city's moved through has happened in, like, a relatively short space of time. Oh, yeah. But I feel like there's, it's, like, it's a really multi-layered city and there's a lot, there's, there's still a lot of places where you can encounter things that feel feel old and have a sense of history to them even though I guess it's a relatively recent history in a way but I think the way people perceive history is so bizarre and I'm sort of okay with it now but like it kind of becomes a problem when you're like some like Republican person or whatever I don't know just like this idea of like the suburbs and the American family as being this like great tradition when it's like a tradition that's like no, only it's super new two generations old and is completely from like an environmentalist perspective on like completely unsustainable. It's yeah. So and it's like, but it's funny because in our tiny human brains, that seems like things have been going on forever that have just been going on for for yeah a very very, very short, short space of time. Yeah. And, I mean, just, like, the whole realm of the history of human beings is so short, really, in comparison to the rest of everything that happens on Earth. But I know what you mean. It's, there's, there's, LA's just huge. There's, there's so many neighborhoods that I still don't even know a, a thing about, you know what I mean? It's like a, it's like a, it's, like, still sort of mysterious to me. I've, oh, one of my teachers at school, like, had this thing that I used to really love about, that she would say about L.A., like, Meg Cranston, and there's, like, some, like, offhanded comment in a lecture that she was doing, but it's, at one point she was like, it's like a city of doors behind which you don't know what. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of, like, I don't know, it's like when I was, when I lived alone, and that, I was like, I'm going to talk about what a creep I am when I'm all alone. <laughs> right. But when I lived alone in that apartment, I sure. used to, like, do this weird, I would get, like, super lonely, and I would do this weird thing in the evening where I'd go and I'd walk around, like, all around my neighborhood, and you could, like, see, like, the different colors of, like, lights of people's windows, and, like, hear them through the windows. Okay. And, like, look at, like, the different colors of, like the different things they were watching on TV and right. how that would project through the windows and, like, smell all the things that they were having for dinner. Sure. And it's, like, it, it, it's like, I guess, like, living here feels like constantly getting to read a lot of books or getting to, like, look into a lot of windows, but, like, not actually ever getting the full picture or the full story of mm -hmm. something. And I don't, I don't know. It's... It's interesting. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's never-ending, uh, fascination is is real and it's a bit of a i think it appeals to i do think though and i think part of why it does appeal to me is it is a little bit of like a wasteland <laughs> like there's a lot of sort of well there's this like feeling of being out at like the edge of everything like when you live in a place that like ends in the ocean 
Yeah, in that's a way, true. like you feel like you've like you've come to like. I mean, obviously, we can now get across oceans and we can do a variety of things, and you can hop on a plane and do whatever the fuck you want. But right, like, of course. There's a certain like land feeling to a place where you like you walk. And there's the edge of the ocean, and you're like, this is as far west as I can possibly be. Right, right. On my own power, at least. Mm -hmm. like, True. And uh, have you ever lived anywhere else besides besides L.A.? Like, nope. besides Southern California? I have not. Oh, my gosh. Have it's... you been up to San Francisco much? Yeah. I've, I mean, I've traveled a lot of places, and I've, like... I mean, I've traveled a lot of places and spent time in a lot of places, but I've only ever lived in LA and I used mm -hmm. to think like I used to think a lot like that I would no, I'm gonna move and I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna live somewhere else but like at this point I have such a strong like community of people that I love and my horses mm -hmm. and also I can't live anywhere it snows oh yeah no it's uh <laughs> I it's, can't do it it's unbelievable what we get away with here in the city with I mean it's February and it's just a beautiful day right now it's just absolutely gorgeous out uh and I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I'll ever leave, really. I, uh, I really, really into it. So, finishing up, what, um, what was the, like, greatest horse you've ever known, would you say? The greatest horse I've ever known? I know, that's probably a no. messed up question, because they were all great. They're all great, and I love all of them, and I constantly get made fun of, because I feel like every other horse that I ever sit on, I'm like, this one's my favorite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What kind of horse do you like? The kind with four legs. But mm -hmm. I'd probably, if I met one with three legs, I'd probably like it too. Yeah. Um, but no, the greatest horse, I, I very, I mean, definitely my first pony, but I would have to say Expresso, who was my most recent, like, actual, really, really my horse. Yeah. And he passed away a couple of years ago. And what made him so special? He was just wonderfully smart and kind and t kind of a bitch, but... In what way? Really, um, like, if I would leave for any stretch of time, he would, like, ignore me for, like, days after I... Like, he would, oh, he, my he, gosh. Like, That's if I was coming good. back after being away, he would stick his head out and he'd, like, call to me. And then as I came closer and closer and I'd be so excited and I'd go, like, run to, like, want to hug him or give him a cookie and say hi and he would just like turn around and walk to the back of his stall and be like don't talk to me oh my goodness really don't just don't and yeah. it would take like a good like three to five days of me being back for him to be like back to normal and like but i just spent, i mean there's like i've thought about this when i think about like the idea of getting another horse at some point yeah of my own um versus just the ones that i work with for clients sure which is just like there's like this really just, and then I'm sure you would have a totally different and equally intense, but just really different bond. But there's this very specific thing of like the horse that takes you from when you're 11 years old to when you're like 25 years old. Yeah. And like mm -hmm. the things that you go through with that horse and mm -hmm. like the things that you like cry into its neck about. Yeah. And the, the thing, like, and just that, like, it's, you know, like you go through, like, you know, when you're that age, you don't have to. You don't have to work. You don't have, like, there's a... I mean, well, actually, I was already working. But it's just... It's different. Like, your level of being able to just, like, sit and spend time and, like, build a relationship mm -hmm. with this one animal is, like, totally... It's just it's just And different. it sees you through so many huge milestones in your life, you know, yeah. really going from being a kid to being a com complete adult. Like, complete adult. adult. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Natalie. My pleasure. And Spike's pleasure. Spike's pleasure, too. Uh, this has been another episode of Let's Gay. We upload twice a week. Also, everyone, please come out to Human Resources on Monday night from 6 to 9.30. That is going to be tomorrow, because this is going to get uploaded, and you're probably going to listen to it on Sunday morning. Hopefully. And, uh, so I'm having an art show, uh, the Gamer Cave, the Gamer Cave. It's going to be, like, a video installation, and also lots of people are bringing their 3DSs so we can play Mario Kart and Zelda and whatever the kids are into these days, I don't even know. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, and if you come in any type of cosplay, you'll be in a, like, I know raffle isn't the right word, but we're going to pick names out of a hat, and two people are going to get $100 gift certificates to Comics vs. Toys in Eagle Rock, which oh. is... The best comic book store in LA, I would say. And you can, and it's not just, you can order stuff from them. So any 
comics or action figures or anything you want, you will probably be able to get it from them with that gift certificate. So come on out to the Gamer Cave Monday, 6 to 9.30. I'm Johnny Jungle Guts. Have a great week.